Welcome back to another Wi-Fi streaming with Ben Miller. I'm slightly more organized today. I uh, just sent out the tweet so we don't have to uh, wait as we usually do for, uh, for me to get the Twitter going. Good to see you all back here on a Wednesday. Let's get today's presentation up. So, you know, part of it is that the presentations are going to be a little bit more spare than usual um, because of the fact that I wanted to have my stuff together and start on time. And so, uh, so yeah, it is uh, Wi-Fi streaming with Ben Miller today. Today is uh, February 5th, 2020. Actually, I better close this so I can post my little chat message. Ooh, that actually reminds me. I... Uh, Forgot my second screen in the other room. Wonder if I should just start this over. In fact, I think I am going to do that. So a little bit awkward uh, here. Um, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just mute the microphone uh, and um, and and go get it. So give me just a second here. First, I'll do the hello. But yeah, I better have my second screen. Hello. Okay, uh, so yeah, so uh, hello everybody out there, and uh, be back in a sec. Forgot my second screen. If I don't have the second screen, I'm worried that I'm going to make major mistakes. So I will uh, be back shortly. Okay, I am back. I uh, fortunately or unfortunately forgot to mute the microphone, so you may have heard my office door there in the background opening and closing a bit. Let's get the uh, second screen going here so we can make sure that everything looks hunky-dory out there. And yeah, I'm back. Today we're talking about connections. That's the uh, topic of the day. Um, you know, it's a topic that I've talked about on the blog numerous times, uh, but it's not a topic, at least to my recollection, that I have talked too much about here on Twitch. Um, you can see the... Uh... Oh my goodness, I just spilled my coffee. <laughs> Another... Uh... Gonna have to take another short break here while I clean up a little uh, coffee spill on my desk. Sorry about that, uh, everybody. Give me just a moment here. All right, everybody, this is Ben back again. Had a little coffee spill happen there. Had to clean that up. Fantastic way to start the stream, of course. Um, <laughs> spilling coffee right on my 
the area of the desk where I keep like, you know, personal pictures and everything. And uh, the type of picture frame I use, of course, is uh, it, it sits right on the desk so the coffee seeped up right into the pictures. Just exactly the way you wouldn't want it to happen. Um, fantastic start to the old uh, stream today. But, as I always like to say, it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. Applies to many, many things in life. Those of you that are football fans saw that with the Super Bowl. Uh, the team that, uh, little known fact, I don't know if it's little known, maybe, maybe it's more well known than I give it credit for, but uh, I, I learned this years and years ago. I'm a big uh, basketball fan, and I learned this years and years ago doing a little bit of just, you know, for my own personal, uh, you know, I don't know, interest, uh, doing some research on the NBA, the National Basketball Association here in the United States. Um, I learned that uh, the finish is a lot more important than the start of the game when it comes to winning. And and what I mean by that is, if, if I look back statistically at if a team won the first quarter of a game, if they outscored their opponent in the first quarter of the game, uh, let's say by one to five points, what was their percentage of uh, likelihood of winning the game? Or at least historically, you know, obviously historical stats can't predict the future, but at least historically, what what was that number? And then, you know, if, they, if a team won by, I, for, I forget the exact numbers I use, but let's say five to 20 points in the first quarter, what was their likelihood of the winning the game? And then similar thing for the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter. Uh, and what I found was that winning the fourth quarter gave you a much, much higher likelihood of winning than winning the third quarter, which was higher than the second quarter, which was higher than the first quarter. Uh, and it went against a, a lot of conventional wisdom in the NBA, at least back at the time. This is, this is uh, something I was looking at probably 20 years ago, maybe a little bit less than 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, cause at the time I, the, part of what triggered me to do it was I was watching basketball and if I'm remembering correctly, it was a, a Chicago Bulls against Toronto Raptors game. And, uh, the announcer talked about the importance of the team starting fast. And then sure enough, uh, you know, let's say Chicago, Chicago had a very bad team at the time. Uh, Chicago gets out to like a 21 to four lead or a big, big lead right to start the game, and then Toronto ends up coming back to win the game. Uh, and I, I was just like, you know, I've seen this happen so many times where teams get out to early leads and lose them in the NBA, and this announcer is acting like getting out to the early lead is the key to victory. You know, I, I am not believing that that's actually true, and, and when I looked at some of the numbers, sure enough, it was the case. And then I, I also saw a similar study about baseball that teams that outscore the other team in the eighth and ninth inning have a way, way higher percentage of chance of winning the game compared to teams that uh, outscore the opposition in, let's say, the first inning, the second inning, the third inning. And uh, so, yeah, I thought it was uh, I thought it was interesting and I thought it was a good metaphor for uh, many things in life that uh, it's all about the finish. So choppy start here, certainly to the day. No doubt about that. Getting getting started on time for once and then spilling my coffee all over. Yes, hello to the UK. Uh, yeah, good to see you back again, Yuri. Um, and let me make sure the old uh, chat is working. Yeah, if, if you're joining me late, I actually started on time for once. Usually it's about this time when I actually kind of get into things. But I, I really wanted to prepare. I even did a little bit less work on... Um, today's presentation you know so here's the start of the presentation we're doing wi-fi streaming here's the topic for today it is the topic of connections um i even did a little bit less uh today than normal on the presentation this morning because i was like i really want to start on time and then of course uh, a minute or two in i clumsily spilled my coffee uh on my desk and uh i've been cleaning it up ever since okay Enough of that, but again, it's all about the finish. So, you know, as, as long as we, uh, you know, cover some interesting stuff here uh, and uh, and give you a good finish to uh, 
the today's stream. Hopefully, that it'll still be of, of uh, interest to you or value to you. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, let's get into it today. Uh, the topic for today is connections. Part of what inspired me to talk about this uh, was kind of go the the last last week, um, and then it might have been a couple weeks ago as well, where uh, I was talking about the uh, issues at at a uh, restaurant where I visited, and the Wi-Fi was a little bit sluggish, and doing some Wi-Fi sniffing to try to suss out. Kind of what was going on, you know. From that talk, I got a request on Twitter saying, "Hey, can you talk a little bit more about Wireshark?" Uh, that's what I did a little bit of uh, last week. Was talking about kind of the setup of Wireshark. I have yet to get into, you know, I I guess I I probably didn't spend as much time actually sharing the Wireshark application with people as as I uh, as I intended to last week. So I'm going to do more of that in a future stream. I'll bring up Wireshark and you know, spend the bulk of the hour, um, you know, kind of in Wireshark and setting things up in Wireshark to, to try to detail that a little bit more. Uh, but what it made me think of was, you know, one of the things that I looked at when, when we were talking about capture setup and Wireshark setup uh, was looking at a device's connection. And it's a topic that A, I haven't really covered here on the stream yet. B, I have covered a little bit on the blog. Uh, you know, you can uh, read the blog there at sniffwifi.com. Um, I haven't posted a new blog post in a couple weeks. I, I have one in the drafts folder that I need to go. It's it's the same one that I talked about last week, actually. <laughs> that, so I got to go in and, and kind of, you know, look at the old drafts folder and, and finish uh, editing that one and, and get it published. Um, it's it's on uh, Wi-Fi six and client devices, so I'll, uh, I'll 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 do my best to get that up this week. Probably not today, but uh, but do my best to do that this week. Uh, so a I haven't really talked about connections on the stream. B I have talked about connections on the blog, and then C, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was kind of doing the longer term project at USC, you know, for those of you that may be newer to the stream, as far as what I do, I've, I've worked in Wi-Fi a while and I do a variety of things, uh, contracting, uh, teaching, etc. you know, and just FYI, I am for hire. So uh, if there is anyone that's looking for a Wi-Fi consultant looking for someone to do the technical writing, developing training material, um, teaching Wi-Fi related stuff, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. Probably email's the easiest way to uh, reach out to me. Um, but yeah, so the, the um, one of the things that I noticed when I was uh, working at uh, USC, you know, a, a relatively large university here in Los Angeles uh, for, for just about a year, one of the things I noticed is there was a bit of kind of a, a paucity of knowledge about Wi-Fi connections. Like everybody knew that you had to be close enough to the wireless access point. Every you know everybody knew that the access point sort of had to be strong enough. Uh, the signal had to be strong enough. Everybody knew that you had to type in the right passphrase or password or whatever authentication method you're using. Um, but Th there wasn't a lot of knowledge about sort of the deeper details of uh, Wi-Fi connections. And it did lead to a couple of situations where, <clears throat> you know, and not to toot my own horn too much, my mom's side of the family is Catholic, so it's always difficult to brag uh, when you're uh, when you're raised at least partially Catholic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but th there were a couple scenarios where it's like, all right, you know, we can't get this device connected. It must be a device problem. You know, we're going to have to replace the device. You know, you tell the uh, the user, you know, the student, or if it's a, if it's kind of like a, um, a single function device, like we had a problem with the uh, barcode scanners to get into the basketball arena. It's like, oh, well, we must need new barcode scanners. These things aren't seeing the Wi-Fi network. Or, oh, we must need... Uh, you know, you must need to get a new smartphone. You know, your, uh, you know, when we did the latest update with our access points, it must have made it so your smartphone is so old that it can no longer connect. Uh, and so, you know, with th there were a couple situations like that where 
the thought was we're going to have to replace this client device. But then after going through and doing a little bit of troubleshooting and really understanding how Wi-Fi devices connect and what some of the differences between Wi-Fi devices can be, um, then, you know, we were, we were able to get the devices connected. We, we didn't have to make any major changes to the infra so sometimes we had to make minor changes to the infrastructure but we didn't have to make any it was just minor configuration changes not even physical changes to the infrastructure and we were able to get those devices connected so it, it might you know that's the third reason i want to go through this it might be useful to some of you maybe you've experienced uh issues with wi-fi devices connecting issues that are perplexing maybe in the future you will and maybe understanding how Wi-Fi devices connect will uh, be of use to you. Uh, before I get started, real, real quickly here, um, this is something I probably should have been doing all along, but I guess I'm uh, somewhat new to Twitch, so I uh, maybe neglect to do it sometimes. But I very much appreciate it if you can subscribe. Whoops. There we go. R I B E. It should be kind of right there above where I just wrote subscribe. If you're uh, watching this video, there should be a little box that says subscribe. If, if you've already subscribed, thank you. Much, uh, much appreciated. But I, I, I'm trying to learn Twitch. I, I know I've been doing streams on it for four plus months, so I should have learned something by now. But, uh, um, you know, look, Twitch is primarily like a video gaming thing, uh, and so, and so, it's not something where I'm, uh, where I'm as knowledgeable about it or, or as used to it, and and so I'm still learning it. But one of the things that I did learn is that to be able to unlock certain features of Twitch, you have to have a certain number of subscribers. So I'm relatively close to one of those subscriber thresholds, uh, and so I figured I would pump it a little bit more on the blog here. That uh, if you subscribe, it can help me out. I. You know, look, I don't know a lot of the details of Twitch. My understanding, at least, is just that if you subscribe, the only big difference is going to be you're going to get an email every time I start up a stream. So basically, uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. I, I am uh, another one of the things that I that I need to do with Twitch to, you know, kind of unlock some of the features is I need to do two streams a week instead of one. And so that's something that I'm working on trying to carve out time, I thought. I had it set up uh, last week and a couple weeks ago for Fridays at 3 p.m. I, I may still try to do Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific time uh, this week. It would be a little bit late in Europe, but um, but that's uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time would be uh, 11 p.m. in the United Kingdom. So, you know, I don't know, maybe... Uh, May not be the ideal time on a Friday night. Maybe it is the ideal time on a Friday night. But um, but yeah, that's that's uh, so you'll get a notification there if I do any kind of uh, ad hoc type streaming stuff. Okay, on to t and for those of you that have never been on the stream, th this is just you know a default photo from uh, Apple's Keynote application. But I absolutely love this photo. Uh, you know, mom with ostensibly the kid, nice mountainous area in the background, kind of looks like Southern California. I'm not sure if that picture was taken in Southern California or not, but definitely the, the mountains with the water there is kind of a feature of uh, some areas of uh, Southern California. So, uh, so yeah, that's not a picture of me. You can see a picture of me on the screen there if you look in your lower right. So yeah, let's get to it. Uh, let's talk about Wi-Fi connections and I want to start off by just talking about connection basics. Uh, so, so what's actually happening when a Wi-Fi device connects? And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make relative. I, I have a relatively spare presentation because I wanted to make greater use of, of kind of the virtual whiteboard here today. Um, and uh, so, so let's go through kind of the basics of a Wi-Fi connection. Wi-Fi connection. So uh, what we have here is our little Wi-Fi device. Let's say it's a laptop. We have here one or more access points. Let's say they're using the SSID of Ben. And uh, we want to talk about what's going to happen when the Wi-Fi device looks to connect. Um, as mentioned on the previous little 
very rudimentary PowerPoint. Uh, the first step is discovery. Discovery is sometimes also called scanning. And the process of discovery or scanning is just trying to find an access point. Uh, the, the key thing that the client device is looking for is SSID. So the client device is saying, I want to find an access point that's using the SSID that I, the client, am trying to connect to. So in my little example here, I have these uh, wireless access points. One of the things that happens during scanning, so step one is scanning. One of the things that's going to happen during scanning is there will be beacon frames. Beacon frames come from access points. Beacon frames are at regular intervals. And beacon frames are broadcasts, meaning any client device in the area is going to be able to hear these, uh, these beacon frames. There's also another way that scanning can happen, and that is with the probe, the probe request and response, whoops, EST and response. The probe request comes from the client device. The probe response comes from the AP. And the probe response is basically a beacon. The response is approximately equal to a beacon. Whoops, to a beacon. So there's two different ways for a client device to do discovery or scanning, whatever term you want to use for it. The client device can do it what is sometimes called passively by just sitting there and listening for beacon frames. The beacon frame comes from the access point or the client device can do it actively by sending a probe request out. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds when it comes to uh, discovery or scanning, but I, I will sort of give you some basic information here. Um, one piece of basic information is that with a typical modern client device, the client device is always going to be doing passive scanning if the client device is not connected. So if your smartphone, laptop, whatever Wi-Fi device you're using, and, and smartphones are probably the big one, right? Because those get carried out in public. Smartphones get carried into locations where there's no Wi-Fi, and smartphones will often be active in locations where there's no Wi-Fi. You know, someone will be outside, whatever, you know, walking down the street, walking through a shopping center, walk, you know, in a park, wh wherever the person is and they'll be using cellular to get a data connection on their phone. Their phone's Wi-Fi radio will be turned on, and while the Wi-Fi radio is turned on, that Wi-Fi radio will constantly be listening for beacons. It'll constantly be saying, you know, hey, is there an access point out there using an SSID that my phone is configured with? You know, I've configured my phone with the SSID of Ben while I'm at the park, whoops, while I'm at the park, my client listens for the SSID of Ben at all times, okay? Um, for typical modern client devices, when the client device does active scanning, when the client device sends probe requests, for a typical modern client device, a fake MAC address will be used, okay? That's the way a typical modern client device is going to work. So that's an important thing to note for those of you that um, might be looking at packet captures or might have some type of enterprise wireless LAN monitoring tool that shows you a list of client MAC addresses that are present in an area, okay? The client MAC address that you see in probe requests 
is often not a real client MAC address. Oftentimes, that's that's not your device actually trying to connect. I, I'll I want to sort of pause here. We'll get to step number two in a little bit. So you know, just to kind of figure finish out what's happening here with scanning. What's going to happen is my client device here is going to listen for these beacons. My client device also might send out an occasional probe request. PRQ is what I'm using there for probe request. And the key, the, the overarching goal here, the key thing that we're looking for here is after scanning, the client is going to choose one BSSID. BSSID is just an access points MAC address. So my client is choosing one access point. So my client's gonna listen to these beacons. My client might send probe requests, but if it's a modern client, my client is gonna send the probe request using a MAC address that is not my clients, that's some fake MAC address. And my client at the end of this is going to choose one BSSID. What we know for sure is that the BSSID is going to have to come from an access point that uses the SSID of Ben, that, that uses whatever SSID my client device is connected to. What we don't know is what other factors the client is going to use to choose. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Just to give you this preview, I know I, I already kind of accidentally went to this page, but different clients may prioritize different things. Clients may remember certain access points. Clients may blacklist, graylist, or whitelist certain access points. So, you know, there there's, and, and look, when, when I say remember BSSIDs, this is something that's designed to allow the client devices to do faster roaming. It's designed to make it so that the client device can say, hey, I was connected to access point number 34 here at Walmart, you know, at some gigantic retail location. The last time I was on access point number 34, I roamed to access point number 27 and channel uh, and access point number 27 was on channel 52. So now as a client, now when I'm on access point 34, when I get to such a low signal strength that I need to roam, the first channel that I look on is going to be channel number 52. I'm going to try to make roaming faster by looking on the channel that the access point was on previously, you know, looking at the channel that I remember. Actually, uh, I'll tell you, you know, I I blogged about this fact several years ago. You know, maybe maybe I'll uh, look and see if I can find the blog link to to uh, kind of give you guys if you want to look at a little bit more detail about this. Uh, but but what I'm talking about there, this remembering of access points, this is something that comes from the 802.11k amendment. It's been out for a long, long time. iPhones support 802.11k. I believe most Android devices also support 802.11k. It's it's relatively widely supported. And one of the things I noticed, you know, since I wrote the blog and since this got sort of more widely known, since there was more awareness within the wireless LAN industry um, about this, I've noticed that access points do a lot less channel changing than they used to. You know, whatever. Let, let's say I wrote the blog maybe, uh, I don't know, three years ago, two or three years ago, something like that. I'll, I'll have to look on the old, uh, let me let me take a quick gander at the blog and see if I can uh, find that here. 802.11k. Uh, yeah, March 23, 2016. And here I'll, uh, for those of you that uh, want to look at the blog. Now look, the title of the blog may be a little bit dramatic. What's, what's actually happened is, uh, and, and you know, for those of you that may be unaware, when, when I say ARM, that's the old name for the protocol that Aruba Networks now calls AirMatch. 
So, you know, look, the the it wasn't a nail in the coffin, but it was a 802.11k did end up being a nail in the coffin for access points changing channels. If you go back 4 years ago or more, if you were using Aruba ARM uh, adaptive radio management or Cisco RRM radio resource management, your access points would change channels relatively frequently. And it was really messing up roaming. It was making it so that a client, you know, again, a client in your Walmart was connected uh, to uh, access point number 34. It remembered a neighboring access point on channel 52. The client would try to do a nice fast roam by looking on channel 52 and the neighboring AP would be gone. The neighboring AP would have changed to channel number 149 or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, the... This is something that, uh, you know, is, is sort of for fast. The, the reason why I'm getting into this is I just wanted to clarify the difference between these two. It's like, does the client remember SSIDs? That's something that's designed for faster roaming. Does the client have a bla blacklist, graylist, whitelist? That's something that's designed to prevent dead zones. Uh, dead zone is where a client A can connect, uh, but B has no internet or no network access, no data access. So sometimes client devices will blacklist or gray list an access point if the client has previously connected to that access point BSSID and had no internet access when connecting. I, I have found in the last couple of years, the blacklisting is less aggressive than it once was. If you go back two years or so, um, maybe, maybe even a little bit further than that. It, it used to be a real problem, especially with iPhones. iPhones were very aggressive in blacklisting, and it, it just used to be a very frustrating experience where the iPhone would connect to an access point, have no internet access, put the access point on a blacklist, and then if you fix the problem, right, if the access point now doesn't have that problem anymore and now allows internet access for all clients, the client just wouldn't connect to it. The client the client would avoid that access point. So you'd have a, I, I actually ran into this, I think it was about two years ago. You know, there's this big open office area. There's access points all over the place in this big open office area. And we would have a case where let's say this access point got blacklisted for a smartphone that was relatively close to it. And no matter what we did, we couldn't get this darn smartphone to connect back to the access point. Once once the smartphone had blacklisted that access point, the, the smartphone would only try to connect to APs that were further away. And the end result to the user was a less than optimal Wi-Fi experience. What we ended up having to do, and this, this ended up causing a, <clears throat> you know, a lot of problems for folks, uh, was we had to, it was a little setting on iPhones. It was something like remove Wi-Fi history or something like that or reset Wi-Fi history. But essentially it would wipe out all of your old SSIDs, all of your old BSSIDs that were remembered and kind of make it so that the iPhone would start fresh from a Wi-Fi perspective. Because, because you know, the first thing we tried to do was just remove the SSID. But then what we found was that removing the SSID did not remove B SSIDs from the blacklist. So we'd re-add the SSID and the darn phone still wouldn't connect to the access point that was blacklisted. What we found though is if we completely wiped out the Wi-Fi settings, the Wi it was like reset Wi-Fi settings or something like that, then it would remove all blacklists and the phone would start from scratch. The problem is you know, we would tell users to do this. We'd tell someone who's working in this office, okay, you know, sorry, your phone got blacklisted from the AP that's nearby you. You know, we've done a bunch of testing with it. The only way we can fix it is to wipe out all your old Wi-Fi networks. And, you know, in every single case, when we told the user that, the user initially was like, no way, I can't do that. Like, I have my home network saved in there. I don't even remember my password. I have networks for coffee shops in my neighborhood, relatives' homes. I, I don't want to have to go asking all these people for their password again. It, you know, it's awkward enough to have to do it. Um, and, and, you know, 
Plus, th this happened in the United Kingdom, where, you know, fear of awkward interactions is a major part of the British psyche. Uh, hopefully that doesn't sound too, uh, you know, too much trafficking in, in stereotypes. But, uh, you know, look, got, got to keep it real on here. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, <laughs> London has changed a lot over the last, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years. But... Uh, something, some things about uh, London and about Brits uh, definitely have not changed, and fear of awkward social interactions is definitely one of those things that uh, that, that remains up there for uh, for the Brits. Um, yeah, it, it, and and Rich, uh, it sounds like has uh, experienced this as well. So it was just tough. It, it was, it, you know, some people were willing to do it, uh, and you know, then of course the problem is it's like. If they remove all their networks, so now they're able to connect, you know, now, yay, I can connect to this access point again. And then, uh, but they have some other Wi-Fi problem. Then they really got up. There was one guy in particular who really got upset with us because it's like he, he was able to connect again to the access point that was nearest his desk. But he still had a roaming issue elsewhere in the office uh, with his phone and, and that one we couldn't solve because of aesthetic limitations. We just weren't allowed to physically move access points. This was a project purely, we were told in advance, look, or I was told in advance, look, you know, we're bringing you in. We do not want to move anything. It's like the owner of this company basically, you know, wishes that he would have been an architect, so to speak. And uh, so so he loves having a cool looking, very kind of feng shui office. Um, you know, we had to go through all of these levels of bureaucratic approval within the company just to get the access point locations that we have. So we're not going back to the owner and saying, hey, give us new approval for moving. Like it was hard enough just to get access points that were exposed below the ceiling. Uh, because the owner and the um, interior designer thought that that was too ugly. Um, and so so we we couldn't even solve this guy's roaming problem. plus we caused him to delete all of his uh, all of his saved access points. It was uh, it, it was it was not a uh, not an enjoyable um, discussion to have with someone. Okay, but I'm digressing here. The bottom line is getting getting back to what I was talking about. Uh, first step of the Wi-Fi connection, scan. And then choose a BSS ID. Let me let me share a little bit of Wireshark with you before we uh, proceed to the next step here. Give me just a moment. There's my Wireshark. Okay, you should be able to uh, see Wireshark now. So this is the same. Uh, excuse me, this is the, the same restaurant capture that I had used uh, a, a, at least twice before uh, on the stream. Uh, and uh, right now, if you look at kind of the top of the screen, you can see I filtered on my smartphone's MAC address. So this is all the stuff that my smartphone was uh, sending back and forth. And, uh, you know, I, I, can, I, I can, whoops, I can go and uh, look for the um for any kind of uh discovery that was happening so a little tip if you're using wireshark if you're doing packet captures um is to use that little expression window hopefully you can see that up at the top of the screen just to the right of that green bar it says expression what i'll do here is i'll type and so i'm doing kind of a complex filter i'm filtering on my phone's mac address and the probe frame that's sent during discovery. So I do and, and then I click expression. And then you may remember this from, uh, I believe it was last week, maybe a couple weeks ago, wlan.fc.type underscore subtype is the filter that allows me to choose one type of frame. So there it is, the probe request frame. And I'll put that in the, uh, uh, in the chat area here. So if you want to filter in Wireshark, you can use the expression window. And actually, I, I don't think I showed you all the expression window. I'll, I'll show you that in, in just a moment. Uh, I think I forgot to show that on screen. Uh, and then uh, and then for, uh, for a type or a subtype of frame, 
it is uh, wlan.fc.type underscore subtype equals equals. So wlan.fc.type underscore subtype equals equals, and then some type of hexadecimal code for the frame. So yeah, let me get back to uh, Wireshark, show you what I'm talking about here. So I click Expression. When I click Expression, I get this here window. I type in the search area, wlan.fc.type. That narrows it down here. I open up and I choose type underscore subtype equals equals. I find the probe request. When I click OK, now when I go back to um, you know the main Wireshark window, notice how this has all been filled in. Well, actually, I already typed in the and, but this has been filled in. So I click the little blue arrow at the top of the screen to apply the filter, and there's the filter, you know, showing what my client device had sent in terms of probe requests. Notice, though, with all of these probe requests, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to show me an empty SSID. That's, or ac actually, I'm sorry, it'll, it'll show me right before the client connects, it'll show me the real SSID. But for most of these, it's going to be an empty SSID. That's for security reasons. But like for, for, uh, so, so notice here, this is frame number 3,938. If you look kind of on the left-hand side, there's that NO column. There's the number column there. So this is frame number 3,038. If I look at all probe requests, so now I'm no longer just limiting it to uh, my phone. Uh, notice here, we should see at least one. that's going to use the same name. It's probably this one here. Uh, so notice here, very, very similar signal strength. Hopefully you see that kind of uh, towards the right there. Uh, third column from the right says signal. So 3938, that was one that came from my phone. Signal negative 44, signal negative 40, probably also came from my phone. And some of these other ones have a completely different MAC address. So this is a totally different MAC address than my phone. What most likely is happening here is my phone is sending out these uh, probe requests just using a fake MAC address. This is, uh, there's a decent chance that this MAC address is not used for anything except for um, except for probing. Like if we just look at this MAC address, notice this is just used for probing. SA is source address, TA is transmitter address. That's what I usually like to use uh, when searching because source is a wired address, transmitter is a wireless address. So sometimes if you search on source address, you might miss a couple of things. Uh, here I'm looking at transmitter address or WLAN.TA up at the top. And I can see this MAC address is only used for probing. So almost certainly this is a MAC address. This is, this is not the real MAC address of my iPhone up here. But this is just my iPhone using a fake MAC address to do some probing. And that's a security measure that Apple has put in, that some other devices, uh, some other device makers have put in, you know, th th things of uh, that nature. Okay, let's uh, get back to the connection process. Give me just a moment here. All right. So, you know, unfortunately, whenever the, the way I have it set up now, I got to figure out a bit better way to get this, uh, get my sort of iPad based whiteboarding uh, set up. But the, the basic way it's set up right now is whenever I get out of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, everything gets removed from the whiteboard, which which isn't the worst thing in the world. Sometimes I need to clean up the whiteboard, but, uh, you know, it can be mildly annoying. So uh, step one. 
discovery after discovery the client chooses an access point that's supposed to say choose so the client chooses an access point then the client device goes through authentication and association authentication uh, association i should say is just the equivalent of a wired port connect So th this, this is basically a layer two connection, a data link layer connection, a link layer connection, a Mac layer connection, whatever word you want to use for it. That's what association is. So the client device is going to do this discovery where it looks for APs. Then the client is going to go through these two steps, this authentication and this association. And once the device is associated, that's the wireless equivalent of just plugging into a switch port. That's, uh, that's what that is. A couple of notes here on authentication and association. Uh, this authentication is not your WPA2 or WPA3 authentication. This authentication is not the stage where your password, passphrase, web authentication. It's, it's not your real authentication. This authentication is part of the 802.11 standard, okay? So it's something that has to happen. In order for a device to get associated, the device has to first get authenticated. So, so this is something that has to happen. Um, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not like the place, it's the place where your password is validated or your username and password is validated or anything like that. Uh, that, that part comes later to uh, steal a line from a, a Batman movie. Um, so yeah, so that's, that, that, that's what's going to happen after discovery. So it's like, you know, my little, uh, I'll kind of try to show the example here. Here's my little laptop at the restaurant. Here's one AP. Here's another AP. They are both using the SSID of Ben. And my client device is going to listen for those beacon frames that are coming from both access points, the uh, passive scanning. My client might send a probe request, PRQ, probe request uh, to these uh, access points. Again, that's not mandatory. That's something that could happen but doesn't have to happen. But then after that, my client device is going to choose one access point. Let's say it chooses the access point over here to the right. And when my access point chooses the access point to the right, then my client device is going to do 802.11 authentication. Then my client device is going to do association. So a couple of little notes about this. If you're going to do any kind of troubleshooting, wireless sniffing, etc. The authentication frame rarely has anything interesting in it. However... The authentication frame is a great frame to search for a client connection. You know, if, if you're in Wireshark and you're saying to yourself, gosh, I captured hundreds of thousands or millions of packets. I filtered on, I've isolated the traffic that only this one specific client device was sending and receiving because I'm trying to troubleshoot this client device's connection. But there still is all of this traffic going back and forth, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of frames that I've captured. H how do I quickly find kind of the place in the capture where the client was trying to connect? A, a, a way that I'll look for that is by searching for authentication frames. By using that little expression window that I was in, searching for the authentication frame because authentication always has to happen. Anytime a Wi-Fi device makes a connection, there's always going to be an authentication frame uh, that's that's part of that process. And so that's that you know I, I that that tends to be the frame that that I sort of seek out. If I say to myself, okay, we had a problem with somebody's um, you know surface tablet, and we want to figure out why this Surface device isn't connecting. 
Let me do this packet capture. All the stuff that I talked about last week, remember that I talked about kind of the process of doing a capture. Find out what channel the nearby access point is on. Set, find out the channel width. Set your capture tool to capture on the channel width. Make sure your capture tool supports a standard that the client supports. Make sure your capture tool supports enough MIMO streams. You know, if you have a two-stream client, make sure your capture tool supports at least two streams. We talked about transmit beamforming last week and how that can affect capturing. We talked about uh, Wi-Fi 6, uh, 802.11ax. Wi-Fi 6, 802.11ax has a technology called OFDMA that can affect capturing. So, so you want to factor all those things in. You do your capture. You ha- you tell the, the user, okay, turn on your service tablet, try to connect, try to do this and that. You look at the packets that you've captured, you isolate the packets that the surface has sent or maybe that the surface has received. And then if you're, you really wanna isolate that connection, what I do is I usually search for the authentication frame. So that, that's kind of how I use the authentication frame. When it comes to the association frame, the re- that one can be a little bit tricky because the way Wi-Fi works, and we're not going to get into too much roaming this week, but in a later stream, I will talk more about roaming. Association is a little bit tricky because for a device's initial connection to an SSID, the device will associate. But for any type of roaming connections within an SSID, so I connect to the SSID of Ben... I move somewhere, I get a little bit too far away from the initial access point that I connected to, and so now my client device decides I'm gonna connect to a new access point that uses the SSID of Ben. That, that's that's roaming, That that's what I'm talking about here is moving and having to connect to a new AP. For any type of roaming connection, the device reassociates. And so, if you search for the association frame, you you might not catch what the de- you know the device's connection. The device might have done a reassociation instead of an association. Now, if you're if you're trying to only search for when a device roamed, then maybe you look for a reassociation. If you're trying to only search for when a device made its initial connection, maybe you look for association. Uh, but that's why I don't really search on association. Where the association frame can still be useful, however, is it can sometimes tell you about what sort of the client supports. Is this client 802.11n? Is it 802.11ac? Is it 802.11ax? Meaning Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6. Uh, does the client support 802.11k? Does the client support 802.11r, which is the fast roaming uh, technology that, again, I'm not going to get too much into this week, but will in a in a future stream. Um, you, all, all sorts of things. What types of speeds? You know, how many MIMO streams? Uh, all sorts of client information can be seen in the association request. Uh, another place where you can find out what the client supports is in the probe request as well. You can also look at probe requests. But those two frames tend to show you kind of what the client supports. So, again, getting back to kind of the connection basics, the way a Wi Fi connection is going to work is client device has an SSID configured. Okay, let's say the SSID of Ben. Client is going to do discovery with every access point that's using the SSID of Ben. So the client's going to listen for beacons, beacon frames that are coming from access points that use the SSID of Ben. Client might send out probe requests with the SSID of Ben and then perhaps look to receive probe responses from access points that use the SSID of Ben. So client's going to do this discovery. Then the client is going to choose. The client is going to say, okay, there's one access point that I think is the best access point. The client's going to choose that access point. Then the client will do authentication and association. Here, I'll use a different color. Authentication and association. 
and that will be the equivalent of a wired port connect. Now the client device is connected, the equivalent of being connected to a wired switch port. Okay, so that that's that's kind of the connection basics. Let me get back into Wireshark real quickly here to, you know, show you more example. So here's Wireshark. And again, if I want to search for connections, let's show you the expression window. So I just clicked on the uh, expression link there to get to the expression window. If I want to look search for connections, it's wlan.fc.type underscore subtype. There we go. Equals equals. If I want to see all connections that happened, authentication will show me all connections that happened. So get rid of the rest of this. And now it's going to show me all the connections that happened. And so it looks like what happened here was there was basically one connection. This might be a part of a second connection. It's possible that I missed the other part. It's also possible that this was an error, that this was a corrupted frame. Frame is marked false. I'm trying to remember where they uh, show the error flag. This says malformed. So this, this may be a corrupted frame. I thought I had, ah, frame check sequence incorrect. So this is probably not really an authentication frame. If I look at these other authentication frames, frame check sequence correct. And so I thought I had a, uh, a coloring, I thought I had coloring rules that colors the uh, corrupted frames differently, but apparently I don't. I guess I should add a coloring rule. I'll do that some other time. That That's actually, uh, let me write that down because that's a good thing to talk about when uh, I go through Wireshark here. So for the Wireshark stream, make sure I talk about coloring. So yeah, so here I can see the authentication uh, frame number 3943, if I look inside that authentication frame, there's not that much that's interesting. A little vendor specific information about Broadcom, a little vendor specific information about Apple. Code successful, not that much in interesting. If I get rid of this filter and I go down to the association request, here's where I can get some information about my client device. So for example here, uh, let's see if it shows anything interesting. Spectrum management is implemented. Tells me which rates I'm using. These rates are typically dictated by the access point. So the access point has a minimum rate of 18 megabits per second, a minimum basic rate of 24 megabits per second. We talked about that in the previous stream and how that can cause a lot of problems. It, it might have been one of the reasons why this access point was, uh, or sort of why I should say why this network wasn't performing very well, even though there were very, very few clients uh, around. You know, if you look at the probe response here, let me just collapse all. If you look at the probe response, the probe response told me that, where is it? Uh, I thought, there we go. Uh, it tells me that there's only one client device connected to this access point. Channel utilization is very, very low, only 1% or approximately 1% channel utilization, yet this Wi-Fi network was not particularly good. Web pages were very slow to load. Some Sometimes I would have to just outright reconnect to a web page. Speed tests were on the low side. It was about 20 megabits per second down, less than one megabit per second up. Um, so, you know, look, there might have been wired network issues with this network. It's It's a restaurant network, so it's certainly possible that th there were bandwidth limitations or something like that. But Another very, very real possibility is that perhaps these uh, settings here on the access point, the rates that were being set, and also the transmit power of 3 dBm, that 
th- that is probably the reason why this restaurant network doesn't work very well. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not a altogether uncommon thing. In fact, nowadays there's a whole wireless certification about it. Um, there's a, uh, oh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, this is my uh, inexperience with uh, Twitch yet again. So sorry. Let me let me go back to uh, and and kind of re say what I was saying uh, earlier on. My apologies, but yeah. So I uh, when when I did the filter, it took me to I believe it was this one. Let me make sure that is correct. Yes. Sorry about that, everybody. So when I did my uh, filter, it took me to, uh, see, that's why I got to pay more attention to the, uh, um, <laughs> that's why I got to pay more attention to the chat area. My apologies, everybody. Um, but yeah, so so when I did my filter, it takes me to the authentication frames. So I see a couple of authentication frames there showing uh, uh, showing a, a device connected. It, it shows me a few other authentication frames as well, but these are probably not real authentication frames. You can always get an idea of whether something's real or not by looking at the frame check sequence. If it says the frame check sequence is incorrect, that means that the frame is corrupted somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily tell me where. So I don't, why am I getting that blinking here? Hmm. Not exactly sure why I'm getting that blinking effect here. Sorry about that, everybody. Give me... Yeah, I'm still seeing the blinking effect, unfortunately. Give me a second to try to kind of reset the Wireshark uh, sharing with everybody. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit better. Okay. I think it is uh, hopefully stopping blinking. Yeah, I should have learned Twitch by now. I know, I'm. it's sad. I'm probably never going to learn Twitch. That's, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, I wonder if it's when I move the mouse in the area of that might be it. Oh, okay, so maybe this will help. But yeah, so uh, in, in any case, when I look at the uh, frame check sequence, it shows that the frame check sequence is incorrect. That means that this was corrupted somewhere. And it, it doesn't tell me where it was corrupted, though. So one of the places it might have been corrupted is in the type and subtype. Like this might not actually be an authentication frame. And in reality, it's probably not an authentication frame. Um, let's see here. Yeah, look, this would be a 774 byte authentication frame. That That's not an authentication frame. Uh, these up here really are authentication frames. Frame check sequence, correct. And yeah, what, what I was... What I was going to show earlier on is as far as the authentication. So, you know, that's the value of the authentication frame is it allows you to find when the connection happens. As far as the value of the association frames, what I'm going to do is, uh, so notice over on the left, this is frame number 3943. Get rid of that. So, yeah, so... Um, now, now when I kind of go down, so so here's the authentication, the authentication coming back from the access point to my client device saying, okay, you know, you've authenticated successfully. You can see that in here. Successful. Um, the association will give you some information about the client device and what the client device supports. So I can see, for example, here, my client device supports spectrum management. Um, my client device does not support automatic power save delivery. Automatic power save delivery is a method of putting the Wi-Fi radio to sleep to conserve battery life on Wi-Fi devices. 
Uh, these rates come from the access point. That, that was one of the points I was making there when I accidentally had all this stuff hidden. Uh, sorry about that again. The, uh, the rates come from the access point. And, and, and again, I kind of talked about this last week or a couple weeks ago when I was talking about this. Is This is probably the reason why the Wi-Fi wasn't very good. Uh, if, if we look at what the access point supported, we can kind of see that in the probe response. So notice, uh, hopefully under, you can see this under the destination column. This is the MAC address of my phone, MAC address ending in FB54. It's a probe request. It's a probe response, I should say. So it's, it's kind of telling my phone what the access point supports. So the access, so one of the problems we talked about the access point, only using uh, three decibel transmit power, uh, but another uh, problem with this access point is the access point having data rates where 18 is the lowest rate, 24 is the lowest basic rate. Th those are both things that tend to cause a lot of problems. Uh, having the transmit power too low, you, you want this power probably at least at 12, maybe 11 at, at, at a bottom level uh, decibels. You might have it as high as somewhere around 17 decibels. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of disabling low rates. But even if you are going to disable low rates, you definitely don't want to make 24 your lowest basic rate. You're asking for trouble there. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we, we talked about the ghost frame issues, uh, whatever it was last week or two weeks ago. Um, those are the types of things that can happen. And so... You know, it, it's like even when I look under here and it tells me there's only one station currently connected, only 1% of the channel is currently utilized. When I was actually in the restaurant, it was only 20 megabits per second down on a throughput test, less than 1 megabit per second up. Now, that, that might have been a bandwidth contract, so that, that is sort of like a wired problem with their configuration that, that might have been slowing things down. Um, and... and the other, uh, you know, sort of potential, uh, 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 you know, I issue that, uh, that uh, sorry, kind of lost my train of thought there. What, what I meant to say there was um, uh, I also was seeing uh, slow web pages loading, occasionally having to close the web browser and reopen it to, to get pages reload, to get pages to load. Um, I was kind of seeing those things as well. And... Th that that's an indication that uh, you know there there's some problem somewhere. Now look, the problems for this restaurant might not have been purely Wi-Fi. It might have been some type of networking issue. Again, maybe they were they were using bandwidth contracts that were causing a problem. Uh, maybe they had some other type of routing or firewall or whatever type of issue that was you know maybe they they just have old equipment that that can't handle the speeds that uh that that people are trying to use on their network. Who knows exactly what the network problem could have been, but definitely on the Wi-Fi side of things, the, these are two things that probably probably could have been improved to improve the quality of the uh, Wi-Fi at the restaurant. But in any case, you know, you, you look at um, the uh, association request, and even though these rates are set by the access point, so the the client is sort of just mirroring the access point's rate configuration. I still get some other valuable info. I can see this client can go as low as five decibels, as high as 20 decibels. I can see which channels this client supports. You know, that's that that's something that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit when I talk about client variances. That, that was an issue we ran into uh, at USC. Uh, in one of the cases that I was kind of talking about earlier where, you know, the some of the other folks uh, kind of say, oh, you know, after we did this update uh, with with our access points, all of a sudden these clients can't connect. We got to tell these users to get new clients. They must not, you know, uh, they must not be supporting our current uh, OS that we're running on our access points or whatever it is. Um, w w in one of the cases, the issue simply was that the clients only supported channel sets one and four. The, the clients did not support channels 52 through um, 64, channels 100 through 144, or channel 165. So it was just whenever AirMatch set an access point on channel 52, channel 108, whatever it was, the client just couldn't see that access point and it, and it made it look like there was a problem with the client because, you know, every other client in the area could connect just fine. 
so so th- those are some of the things that you can kind of find here if you're if you're able to see the association you can see well what channel now not every client is going to tell you I, I should point that out not every client is going to tell you what transmit power it uses not every client's going to tell you which channels it's supporting uh, HT is 802.11 N VHT is 802.11 AC HE would be 802.11 AX would be Wi-Fi 6 so not not every client is going to tell you everything. You know, if we uh, take a look at all of the probe requests, I believe I did a uh, filter for the probe request before. If we take a look at all of the probe requests, you, you'll see that this information is not present in every probe request. You know, not in every probe request are you going to be able to see this level of detail. But you may be able to see a little bit of information about a given device if you're able to uh, if you're able to capture its probe request. Here, the device supporting 802.11u. That's where the device can get authenticated without having to go through a captive portal. You know th- that uh, that type of stuff. So yeah, so that's that's kind of your basic connection here. Give me just a moment to bring back the old uh presentation here we go a couple other little notes about the connection um i i kind of touched on it already but the client is going to make the decision the client does choose the access point and the other little note i want to make is that any type of authentication or key management is going to come after the association um the authentication and the key management that's where your password or your passphrase uh, or your certificate, that's where those things are validated. So that type of validation is going to come afterwards. If you, uh, if you want to do sort of just a quick and simple Wireshark filter on... Um, uh, uh, looking for the uh, WPA2 or WPA3 information, you can do the filter EPOL.version. So all, all that's going to show you is every type of frame that is tagged as an EAP frame, as an EAP frame, as an extensible authentication protocol frame. And all of the authentication frames, all of the key management frames used in WPA2 and WPA3 are going to have some type of EPOL.version field. So if if you just type EPOL.version into that Wireshark filter area, you'll be able to see all of the WPA2 and WPA3 uh, frames that that are going across. You know, and look, to be honest, I, I find that usually that's not something where you need to do like a packet capture to troubleshoot it. You know, it, it can be very interesting to to do a packet capture to do the EPOL dot version filter and and see you know what is my client sending, what's my access point sending, does this match up with what I saw in the eight hundred two dot eleven standard documents, etc. Maybe if you're studying for a, an exam for a CWSP exam or CWAP exam or something like that, so so it can be interesting to see. But my my experience is like the reality of the situation is if you're troubleshooting someone's client connection and you're using WPA2 or WPA3, and the person's saying to you, oh, I can't get on the network, uh, you know, when I, when I try to connect to Wi-Fi. One of your first instincts is going to be, let's delete this network, re-enter it from scratch, and let's make sure we put in the correct password or the correct passphrase. And, and you know, that doesn't take very long. You know, it's a... It's a we we did that all the time at USC. It, it was so with our problem. Our problem at USC was that we had a mandate to update passwords uh, every twelve months at the absolute most. So you could only keep your uh, password every twelve months. And the problem with that is, especially for Apple devices, 
Apple devices typically will not prompt you for a new WPA2 or WPA3 enterprise password if the initial password fails. So it's it's like I would have to go on some portal, uh, you know, so, some portal that USC had set up, not, not like a Wi-Fi portal, but just a normal internet web portal. I would have to go on some web portal that USC had set up I would say, you know, I need to change my password. Here's my new password. Enter it twice, whatever. And then my Wi-Fi device would try to use my old password because that was the password that was saved on my iPhone is my old password. My Wi-Fi device would fail, but then my iPhone would not prompt me. It would it would just fail. And there were a number of faculty, students, researchers, etc., who kind of got it, who, who said, oh, I just changed my password. Let me try to delete this network, uh, you know, re-add a new network and, and see if I can connect. But we also had a ton of folks at USC who just weren't familiar with that. They, they really hadn't explored, like, the settings uh, it, within an iPhone I'll actually share it with you on the screen here uh, since uh, since I'm uh, talking about the subject. I can I can share my uh, iPhone with you on the screen a little bit here. Um, but yeah, we, we had a, we, we had so many people that were unaware of how to kind of go into the settings of an iPhone and uh, and and delete a um, uh, sorry, just getting my iPhone set up on the screen here. There we go. Uh, we had so many people that were unfamiliar with this that uh, we ended up having to add a little warning to the portal. So, so it's like if if you had gotten the email from USC saying you have to reset your password by this date, that you know passwords have to be reset once a year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you went to this online portal and you changed your password, uh, you actually got a message right after you changed your password that said you will not be able to connect to Wi-Fi with your old password, follow these steps. And, and the steps were, you know, you go into the settings of the iPhone, you go into where it says Wi-Fi, you tap on the little I with a circle around it, that's what I just did there, and you do the little forget this network. Um, and you know, yeah, so, so that, 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 that process doesn't take very long. And so I would say it's, it's not particularly likely that you're going to have to go to the extent of like asking someone, okay, I need you to try to connect with your iPhone or with your laptop. I'm going to capture your packets. I'm going to do an EPOL dot version filter and see if your iPhone is failing. It's like, that might be an interesting research exercise, but as far as like troubleshooting and getting people connected, typically it's a lot quicker to just tell the person, hey, can you forget this network? Try to reconnect. Okay, now you're back on. Or, okay, now you're off. Or you're not back on, and, and then we need to dig a little bit deeper into what's happening here. So that that's at least been my experience. There's been very, very few cases where I actually need to look at a, a cap. Uh, I actually need to filter on EPOL dot version uh, to look at the WPA two or WPA three stuff um, that, uh, that that's happening after uh, after association. That's that's at least been my experience with. It. I mean, look there. There's been times, uh, for example, where the radius server and the controller or or the access points are not communicating with each other. And you can see that in the EPOL dot version filter. Maybe I'll try to find one of those for a future. Um, let me write that down as a future thing to uh, look at. Is uh, failed EP due to server connection. So you know I, I have done that before. You, you do a packet capture, you filter on EPOL dot version, and you can tell okay the server's just not reachable. We don't need to really troubleshoot Wi-Fi. We need to troubleshoot the network connection between our authentication server and our controller and, and make sure they're talking to each other correctly. So I, I, I guess I, I shouldn't say I never use the EPOL version filter, but it's just not something particularly common because usually, again, you'll you'll be able to fix the problem in, in kind of a simpler way. 
Um, now, uh, another thing I do want to talk about. So, so that's kind of the basics of the connection. Discovery, choose an access point, authentication and association. Uh, association, you can get some information about what the client supports. And then final step would be the WPA2 or WPA3 authentication. That's that's kind of the real authentication. And, and what I wanted to mention here is just there can be some variances between client devices. One thing I forgot to mention that I kind of reminded myself of uh, as we were going through here is channel support. That is something that we did run into at USC. Some client devices pretty much supported all Wi-Fi channels. Some didn't. So that's that can definitely be a variance. Uh, but then there's other little variances as well, you know, typically in what the client prioritizes. Some clients, and, and look, it, it can be tough to get this information. It Client vendors have become a lot better over the past, let's say, four years or so about giving out this information, saying, you know, like, iPhones are going to stay connected to their BSS ID unless the signal strength drops below negative 65 dBm, then the client is going to start looking for a new SSID. You know, that that's information that Apple will tell you today about iOS devices. That's not information that Apple was telling you five years ago, 10 years ago about iPhones. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot more information today about how client devices work than there was in the past. But there still can be some gaps there. And so that that's one of the things you, you might want to look at, you know, try to get an idea how exactly do these clients connect. Sometimes a client connects just fine, even though the signal strength is a little bit low from the access point. Sometimes you notice big performance differences or instability if the signal strength is a little bit low. So there are a lot of, of uh, kind of different variances that you might see. Uh, some clients are a little bit stickier to their initial access points. Some clients are a little bit more aggressive when roaming. So th th there's a lot of those things that you can see. It's it's a tricky thing to talk about in a forum like this because it is one of those things where you tend to kind of need to get deep into the weeds a little bit. You need to be able to use client, real world client devices in a number of different scenarios. You need to be able to packet cap capture packets and look at them in Wireshark or in some other protocol analyzer in a number of different ways and see if you can kind of identify patterns. And yeah, this client seems to roam whenever it hits XYZ signal. This other client seems to roam whenever the signal is a little bit lower or the signal is a little bit higher. So um, there, there, there are definite differences there. You know, there, there's some things I can tell you. For example, I've noticed that Apple clients tend to want to stick to the same BSS ID. Uh, I've, I've definitely noticed some roaming compromises. Uh, I guess you would say lower quality roaming in the past. If you happen to have a vendor that ships you out a shipment of access points where some access points have one BSS ID, other access points have other BSS IDs. If you place all of those access points kind of in the same location, Sometimes that can have a little bit of a negative effect on roaming for Apple iOS devices, you know, and, and, and sorry, when I say same BSS ID, what I should say there is same OUI for BSS IDs. You know, so Apple devices tend to want to stick to the OUI, tend to want to stick to those first six digits of the MAC address uh, when they're roaming between access points. So. You know, those are some of the different variances that you might see between devices. Um, and then, uh, you know, last little thing to note here before, you know, I realize I'm already approaching that 90 minute mark. I'm trying to get these streams closer to an hour. I think that's a, a better amount of time, but haven't done a good job yet with it. But just a couple of little things to note when troubleshooting clients, you know, one, I, I am a big believer in kind of forgetting the network or reconfiguring the network. Uh, that's always a great place to start. Um, a, another thing that, that always helps, in my view, is if you have some type of management or some type of monitoring system, that can really help, especially for things like getting a client history or getting the time that a client connected or seeing if there were failures. 
uh, it, it can be very helpful. I've, I've talked about it a few different times on the stream here, but one of the tools that was very, very useful to me when I was working at USC was Voyance. Uh, it's a, uh, it's an, a, a monitoring application, kind of a large scale enterprise, wireless enterprise wide monitoring application from a vendor called Nianza. Uh, Nianza is now owned by VMware. And I found uh, Voyance very, very helpful. I mean, there were multiple times where if we got a trouble ticket of someone saying, you know, the Wi-Fi is not very good on campus today, I wasn't able to make very good connections. Uh, in Voyance, we could look at that uh, person's uh, uh, MAC address of their smartphone and on the right hand side of the screen, we can we can just see a history of what that device has done. And it would tell us connected to, you know, an access point in this building at this time of day, 30 minutes later, move to an access point in this hallway of this building for 40 seconds later, connected to an access point that's in an outdoor area adjacent to this building. You could really kind of track where the device had gone and try to cross-reference that with when the ticket, the trouble ticket was open to try to get an idea of, of whether you have a, a, a connection, a connectivity problem in one area or another. Um, other things having to do with uh, uh, connecting is um, I, I do find captures can help. We, we kind of talked about those uh, earlier on. Uh, for example, again, we, we saw uh, when I was at USC, the issue that I mentioned earlier on with channel support, where if you looked at the probe requests that the client device was sending when it attempted to connect, you never saw certain channels. You never saw the client probing on certain channels. And, and that would tell you, okay, this client just might not support certain channels. And that's the reason why this client can't see certain access points. Um, another problem we ran into at USC was, for whatever reason, uh, there was no authentication and association from the client. So the and and this was on open network. So this was on uh, the guest network on campus, wide open network, no, you know, password, passphrase required or anything like that. You know, no Wi-Fi authentication at least required, and we we would. We would see client devices where the little connection status was just spinning, 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 spinning. And when I did a packet capture, I saw that the client just wasn't sending anything. There was absolutely nothing going through the air on any channel with that client's MAC address. And we never actually got to the root cause of that problem. That, that was an issue that I saw kind of in the last month or two of when I was at USC and we, we never were able to research it or, or get answers from any of the relevant parties about what a bit, what might have been the root cause of that problem. Uh, but what we saw was, and, and you know, this is perhaps going to sound a little bit rudimentary, but basically sometimes clients just would stop being willing to authenticate or associate. And when we power cycled the client, it fixed the problem. We would shut the client down completely, completely powered off, power it back on. We would still have the Wireshark capture going. And then all of a sudden the client's Mac, you know, we had a filter going on the client's Mac address. All of a sudden we would see the authentication, the association, data traffic going back and forth, uh, stuff that we wouldn't see before we power cycled the client. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and look, I know a lot of that's kind of rudimentary, you know, forgetting and reconfiguring, powering off and back on. Um, but, you know, th those are real things that uh, kind of fix the problem. And, and yeah, I, it still kind of bugs me to this day, uh, many, many, many months later, that we were never able to figure out precisely why it was that these clients stopped uh, stopped sending anything. As, as best we could tell, we didn't think the clients were probing either. Like even, even when I just did a filter on probe requests, I didn't see probes that that seemed to be indicative that they were uh, coming from the client device. But, um, but yeah, it's always hard to tell. Cause again, a probe requests typically will use a different Mac address than the client's real Mac address. So it, so it can be a little bit different, difficult to kind of cross reference those things. Um, but yeah, those, those are some of the things we look for. And then of course, you know, 
not not to uh, you know put too much blame on on other folks, but at least in our case, usually it was some type of wired issue. You usually it was like the Wi-Fi connection ended up working, but the user was blocked from having access to whatever type of network resource they were trying to reach via the Wi-Fi because of the way our VLANs were set up, because there was no route, because the firewall was blocking something. Like, usually it was something that was network-related that was causing the Wi-Fi connection problem. And, And I know I'm not, you know, being a tremendous help uh, uh, there by saying that, right? Like, that's the easiest thing in the world to be like, oh, I work in Wi-Fi. It's not my fault. It's your fault. You know, go go solve this problem, networking people. Um, but that, that, that was the reality in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, that's what we found was just the VLAN that we were assigning uh, client devices to in the controller didn't have a route to where it needed to go, didn't, you know, was blocked some service was blocked by some firewall rule, you know, something was happening that was preventing the client from uh, getting where it needed to go, but it was something on the wired infrastructure that was doing it. And that was actually the best part about doing the work at USC is for, for them, their wired and wired and security folks were relatively well integrated. And I'm a person who's sort of big on ownership. So it's like if a, if a trouble ticket came to me, it's like, I, I, I don't want to pass this off to someone. I want to sort of see it through to the end and make sure that the user actually got connected before I cut the cord with the user. And uh, so, so it, it, really, uh, it, it really helped me learn a lot about sort of what some of the networking issues are that can uh, that that can cause uh, that can cause these connectivity issues for wireless users, and uh, th- the other thing I found going hand in hand with that is everybody blames the firewall. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. It was like if we knew it wasn't a wireless problem, some of the other folks on the wireless team they were just immediately handed off to the firewall uh, team, and and it, it was like at least from my perspective. It was like, well, are we sure it's security? Are we sure it's not that there's some type of issue with the way this VLAN is set up and what it has, you know, and, and how it's configured or how the routing is configured for this VLAN or for other resources? Um, but uh, yeah, the firewall folks basically got uh, blamed for everything. Um, it was an amusing part of the uh, work experience that every week when the network engineering team met and the manager for the network engineering team kind of went through trouble tickets in people's queues the poor firewall folks you know they would have a, a bar graph a mile wide um show, showing how many trouble tickets they had compared to everyone else and like firewall guys come on and you know me and one of the other uh, networking guys w- would kind of chat about that like uh those might not all be firewall issues those those, the, it might be some dumping. Uh, it, yes, exactly what Rich is saying there. I suppose that's the other side of it is oftentimes the security folks are amongst the grumpier folks um, <laughs> because of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's what I uh, wanted to go through today, talk about today when it came to Wi-Fi connections. Hopefully this has been at least some help to you. Uh, mentioned there some of the connection tools at least that, uh, that, that I used i mentioned the monitoring systems the the history there especially man was that useful uh to be able to uh to to kind of see the history in voyance or the history in airwave to 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 try to get an idea of of where we might have wi-fi problems you can also get a lot of great information on the client side as it mentions there the scanner tools look i love the scanner tools i've used wi-fi explorer a number of times here um, on the stream, I've used Windows-based scanner tools before, like acrylic Wi-Fi. Those those tools can be great, um, but you know the limitation is you can't really see much about client information unless monitor mode is happening. Um, if you're doing any kind of active scanning, you don't have the ability to see clients, and so it may not help you that much when doing client troubleshooting. You can still see nearby APs. 
So, you know, if you think you might have a co-channel interference problem or something like that, that can be helpful. But, um, but yeah, you know, unless you're doing monitor mode, you can't see it. And then if you want to get hardcore, exactly as I showed you earlier on today, protocol analyzer. If you want to look at the actual frames, check out the old protocol analyzer and uh, see what it's about. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here for today thank you all for joining hopefully you got something good out of it again i much appreciate the uh, uh subscriptions if you're able to subscribe should be right above my head there the little subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already uh you know again i am still kind of learning twitch i know i should have learned it by now you, you already saw me making some mistakes on it earlier on uh in the stream today uh, but, uh, I at least finally found out where the subscribe button is. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so, uh, if you want to, you can do that. Uh, I'll be definitely back next Wednesday. Again, I'm trying to get in the mode of doing two streams a week. The second stream may not be as long. It, it may not be as structured, you know, meaning I try to always have a topic for the Wednesday for if, if I add a second stream, it'll probably be a little bit more ad hoc, a little bit more just kind of messing around on stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you, and, and, and look, if you do have, uh, you know, any kind of, um, uh, suggestions or anything like that, actually, let me get back to the, uh, contact info page, you know, feel free to send me a note on, uh, Twitter. Ben Miller is my, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to email me, Ben underscore Miller at iCloud.com. And uh, I'm always looking for interesting topics to talk about. I know I have a couple, the Wireshark coloring and the, and the EAP exchanges for, uh, future, uh, for future streams. But, uh, but yeah, uh, always uh, looking for other stuff to talk about, especially if it's relevant to uh, what you all are doing. Thank you very much, Bruce. I much uh, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, follow. Okay, it's follow, not subscribe. See, it's, it's man. See, th this is the thing is, like, I've been working Wi-Fi forever, but I'm really not that much of a tech person. Like, I, you know, I know this is going to sound stereotypical, but, like, I never watched Star Trek. I never played around with computers as, like, a hobbyist. I, you know, I don't know why, but just Wi-Fi was something that uh, interested me and appealed to me, and that's why I got into it. But the problem is when I when I have to get out of the networking world and, like, learn software like Twitch, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good. That's why my blog looks so generic and basic. I, I really don't know how to make a blog look good either. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to get there. So yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Uh, yeah, that it's the follow button, not the subscribe button. Uh, my, my apologies. And yes, yes, exactly. If I get to uh, more followers, then there's, I guess, other stuff that I can do on Twitch. Um, but I also got to do two... It might not be two per week, but I think it's like seven per month or something like that. So basically, I got to do two streams per week and trying to trying to figure out how that schedule will go. Okay, again, thanks for joining, everybody. Uh, see you um, next week on Wednesday or perhaps later this week. Uh, and, um, you know, th this this will be up in the Twitch archives for, I think, two weeks. And then I always uh, post these streams to YouTube as well. Um, you know, I'll... I'll I, I don't remember the link to my YouTube channel, but I'll uh, I'll, I'll, po I'll post on Twitter a link to the uh, YouTube stream once uh, once that gets uh, converted to YouTube. Have a good one, all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.